I think we'll need to hear that again at the end of the service. So get ready, ladies. Get ready. I think Amanda's been paying attention to my preaching. <laughs> Amen. I needed to hear that today. As she was singing the chorus of that, I just thought, man, this is good news that I need to hear. And I so enjoy sitting in front of that lady right there, Linda Bridges. Linda, wave to us. Come on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embarrass you. I like sitting in front of her. You know why? Because that lady is completely engaged in every song, and you can tell it. You might not be able to hear from where you're sitting. And, and, and I'm not saying that you have to respond audibly and visually and all, the, all that, you know, however God leads you. But, Linda, you encourage me so much just to sit in front of you and to hear your heart as you praise Jesus. And that's good news. That is wonderful news that you and I need to hear today that what he completes is completely done. And so I hope that today you'll rest. You'll rest in that wonderful truth and that you'll see that through believing that, through really settling into that, that there is victory, there is joy, there is peace, there is removal of fear. Um, what I've been preaching, you know, is very doctrinal in that sense. You know, we're talking about heavy theology in the book of Romans. And you can go ahead and get there in Romans chapter 6 again as we'll start our message here. But it, it can seem very doctrinal, very theological. But these powerful doctrinal truths impact your life practically. For instance, how many of you struggle with stress? Anybody ever get stressed out about anything in life? Whether that's job, family, you know, all the responsibilities of life. Well, you know what the gospel does, or uh, really receiving the gospel? It, to me, it really removes fear, stress, anxiety, worry. Um, the gospel, when you really receive it, boy, it just allows you to, to sleep well. <laughs> even. Um, I don't know if you've ever struggled with the sleeping at night, you know, and just this crippling fear of what could happen, what might happen. Um, man, I think a lot of mental conditions today, and this is just a off-the-cuff statement, and so please understand that. I, I'm not saying that there's not mental conditions that aren't biological and chemical, but, but man, I think a lot of mental conditions are today are because we've gotten away from the gospel. And the gospel really sets you at rest in your mind. And so um, my invitation to you today as we start our service here is taste and see that the Lord is good. Believe that he's really that good. And that your life will be blessed because you trust in him. Oh, it won't be perfect. You'll have storms. You'll have struggles like we all do. But you know what? is even better than God calming the storm out there is when Jesus calms the storm in here. So even if you're going through a storm, you're at peace. And so taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, when you taste the goodness of God's grace, it will begin to transform your life. It really will. I've not only seen it in my own life, I've seen it in the lives of several uh, friends, family, brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we really set our minds on the goodness of God's grace, what it does is it starts to change us. Romans 2, 4 says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. That word repentance means a change of mind. When, when you really settle upon the goodness of God and see that he's good and, and see his grace for what it truly is and all of its implications, um, it really does start to change you. God's grace is not only good news for deliverance from the penalty of sin, like we talked about last week. It's also good news for deliverance from the power of sin, as we began to unwrap that idea here in Romans chapter 6. As I mentioned last week, Romans chapter 6 is kind of a major turn in our study in the book of Romans. Chapters 1 through 5 have really set up why we need the deliverance of God from specifically sin's penalty, God's eternal wrath against uh, sin... And so in chapters 4 and 5, we see that wonderful truth of the deliverance from sin's penalty. But now in chapters 6 through 8, we're going to see how the gospel is also good news for being delivered from sin's power. But is that really true? 
Is it really true? I mean, can the gospel really set you and me free from sin's power? Why is it that sin still seems to get the best of us even after we've been saved? I think this is a safe survey to do. How many of you sinned this week? Raise your hand. Why is it, a, why is it okay to raise your hand? Because we're, we're, we're not here to pretend. I mean, is anybody here to pretend that they're perfect? To pretend that they've got everything Okay, okay, good, good, good. We're here today because we know that we need to hear something. You're here today because you want to hear some good news that can truly change your life. But why is it that sin still seems to get the best of us even after we've been saved? You know, sadly, some preachers will tell you that if you still have a sin problem after you've been saved, then you must not really be saved. Let's just, let's just think about that for a second. Can a Christian commit acts of sin after, thou, after their salvation? Well, you just admitted that you can, because you just said you sinned last week. So, if that's the case, and certainly many scriptures confirm that Christians can sin after th their salvation, if you're ever in doubt of that, read the book of 1 Corinthians. Specifically chapter 5. There was some bad stuff going on at the church of Corinth. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to sugarcoat that. Read Corinth. But yet Paul calls the Corinthians saints, which is interesting. So what is Paul making the case of here in these verses in Romans chapter 6 and also at other portions of his writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Well, if you say that a Christian can't struggle with sin after, after their salvation, what you're really saying is you're attacking the teaching that Paul laid out last week in Romans 6 about the very change of our nature. What do I mean by that? When you were a lost person, could any of your good works change your sinful nature? No, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. So none of your good works could change your sin nature before salvation. Neither can a born-again believer's sinful acts change their righteous nature after salvation. But, no, no, believe that. Receive it. Settle into it. Actually believe it, because that is truth. You see, many Christians have accepted the first side of the truth. Yeah, preacher, not by works of righteousness. We can't do any good works to change our sin nature. We can't do, you know, we can't help, help enough little old ladies across the street. We can't give enough money to charity. But yet I hear preaching sometimes that says, well, if you're sinning, well, then you probably didn't get saved. Baloney. Now, if we're sinning after salvation, should we ask questions? Yeah. That's a healthy thing as you're going to hear today. But if we receive the first half of that statement then we must receive the second half. You see, the Bible says on the first half of that statement, um, our righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, verse 6 tells us. Filthy rags. Look that up in a commentary. That's how bad your good works are before salvation. They do nothing to change your spiritual condition. In fact, the Bible says over in Ephesians 2, verse 3, that you were by nature the children of wrath. By nature the children of wrath. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. So if we receive the first half of that statement, we must receive the second half. If there's nothing you could do to change your sinful nature before salvation, then there is nothing you can do after you've been born again to ever change the fact that you have been made righteous by a work outside of you. It's called the finished work of Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God, whose blood was shed, slain to take away our sin. And so if our righteous acts as a lost person couldn't change our sinful nature, 
then neither can our acts of sin as a Christian change your righteous neighbor, nature. Some of us need to hear that this morning because you have been plagued with doubt. You see, the error that gets taught many times of believing in a dual nature, and I realized last week there's still some questions from that sermon, you know, did the preacher go off the reservation by saying that when we got saved, our old man was crucified, it was rendered dead? Just look at Scripture, right? Paul made that argument in Romans 6, verses 1 through 14 last week as we studied. And if you missed that, go back and listen to it. But the problem is, is when we believe the error that we still have two, two dual natures inside of us now as believers, all that does is give ammunition to the accuser. And the Christian slides into what seems to be a never-ending cycle of doubt, uncertainty, despair, and defeat. Yet the Bible declares something totally different about who we are in Christ. The Bible says that we're more than conquerors. The Bible says that we're a new creation. The Bible says that we're no longer sinners, but we're saints. The Bible says that something drastically happened when we were born again. And so what happens now is when we sin, there's something inside of us now that just hates the fact that we sin. What do you think that is? That's called the Spirit of God. And when we sin, we grieve the Spirit. And so, and so there's this part of us that, that hates what we're doing. But there seems to still be a part of us, the old self, it seems like it's the old man, that really likes what we do. Why is that? You know, if I'm so new, why do I still, still feel and act like the old me? And Hold on, uh, here in a couple of weeks we'll get into Romans 7 a little bit deeper and see Paul's struggle and why he struggled so. But what needs to truly change in order for us to see lasting change in our lives? And what we really started to try to unpack last week was our thinking. Our thinking needs to change. We need to renew the mind. Now everybody in this room this morning has a mind. Just in case you're wondering. I know that sometimes we can wonder, but we all do. Uh, we all have a mind. And what we talked about last week is we need to really start setting our mind on the truth of the gospel. Paul says this way over in Romans 12. We'll get there here in several weeks. But Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What you think is so important about who you are. Right thinking, right believing will lead to right behaving. But we are so concerned about right behaving that we try to get that before everything else. But if you try to get that before everything else, you're just going to behave worse and worse and worse. You'll get more frustrated and more frustrated. So we need to renew our mind. Paul uh, even alluded to this again over in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 when he said... For we walk in the flesh, but we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down wrong thinking, imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so this truth that we're talking about, the gospel... We must set our minds on that to be true. We must believe it. We must receive it. We must know it. And that's what Paul really got into last week as we look back at Romans 6. He says several times over and over, he says, you need to know this. You need to know this. You need to know this. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 6. And look at verse 9. All those verses start with the word know. There's some truth you got to know. Why? Because when you know the truth, it'll set you free. If you don't know that the chains have been broken, if you don't know that the prison door has been thoroughly blown apart, then you will sit in prison the rest of your life thinking you're still a prisoner. If you had a million dollars in your bank account, but you didn't know it, what good would it do? How would it help us? And so what Paul is saying here, what God is saying here, 
is that we must know these things to be true and in knowing them, believe them, receive them. And so this journey of finding that we've been delivered from sin's power starts with knowing the truth about what really happened at our new birth in our union with Christ. And so today we continue our study and see how it is that we can now live holy by realizing who we already are and by realizing that when we do choose to sin, we are actually going against our new nature and we're only allowing Satan a foothold back into our lives again. So do we want to be finally free from the sins that we seem to continually battle with and beset us? Then know this truth. Know what happened at the cross Renew your mind about what happened there and watch your life transform. Really, one of my biggest prayers as a ministry here at Fairview is that we would be in the mind renewal business. Renewing your minds to the absolute truth of the gospel. And so, why should we live holy? We talked about this last Sunday night a little bit and really got into the two main reasons that Paul gives here in Romans chapter 6 of why you should live holy. And he really um, splits up this chapter with pretty much the same question, just restated a little bit different. Look at verse 1 of Romans 6. We looked at this last week. We knew that Paul was having to answer an objection because he had stated the gospel so clearly and so powerfully, he, he, he anticipated this objection. What shall we say then? Shall we just continue to sin because grace abounds? So Paul was having to answer this objection that says, well, if you're saying that God's grace is limitless, matchless, inexhaustible, eternal, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound, hyper perisuo abound. I mean, if, if that's the case, then, then Paul... Just go live it up. Paul's like, no, 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 no. You don't understand what really happened in the gospel. So he says that in verse 1, but then he comes back and he kind of restates it in verse 15, where we started our reading this morning. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Again, no, 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 absolutely not. If you remember last week, I said this is the strongest uh, way that Paul could say no without using profanity in the Greek language. I mean, this was, God forbid, no. And so there's two reasons that God gives after those two responses to the question, two reasons why God's grace doesn't lead us into more sin, it actually leads us out of sin. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. And so last week we talked about knowing who we're in, knowing what our new nature is, knowing that we have been made completely new at the core of our being. Yes, there's still a struggle, but, but the nature of that struggle is not what perhaps we've always thought it to be. And so why should we live holy? You see, you don't live holy to earn God's favor... You live holy because you already have his favor and have been given his nature to actually desire holiness. There was something in you that made you come to church today. What was that? That was called, if you're a believer in Christ, that was called the Spirit of God. You desired to be here to hear what agrees with your spirit and so that's why you're here this morning. You, you want to hear good news. I mean, when, when Amanda was singing that song, I, all I could say is she was singing that uh, chorus over and over was, that's so good. That's so true. That's so powerful. You know why? That, that was the Spirit of God saying, yes, amen. That's true. And so when we realize that, you see, religion says, all the religions of the world say, you've got to do this in order to earn this. It's a reward-based economy. It's an earning. But God says, no, 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 that's not the gospel. The gospel is you've been given, and now watch your life change. Watch this gift transform you. And so that's what, really what we looked at last week. If, if you could sum it up in a sentence, that's what we looked at last week in our message. This week, we look at this truth. If this has truly happened, if we've been given a new nature then why would we want to place ourselves back in servitude to that which we've been delivered from? If Christ went to the lengths that he did to rescue us from what Adam did in the garden, then 
why would we go back? And when you change your thinking about this and you see it from that perspective, it really does start to transform our lives. You see, the greatest thing Satan wants to do for us in this room, the greatest thing he wants to accomplish is to keep us ignorant. Ignorant. Satan is always fighting against the knowledge of God. The truth of the knowledge of God. Why? Because he wants to keep you enslaved. He wants to keep you in this endless cycle of doubt, uncertainty, defeat, depression. He wants to keep you thinking that, well, well, I've got to earn it. I've got to work hard enough or I've got to be good enough to keep it. And so Satan is always at battle against the presentation of the clarity of the gospel. Why? Because he wants to keep us in darkness. 2 Timothy 2.25 says, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance, a change of mind, to the acknowledging of the truth. And so God wants us to see that we have been made holy through the blood of Jesus. We have been given a new nature. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. The Bible says we have been made partakers of the divine nature. News, the Holy Spirit doesn't share space with your old dead spirit. You've been made quickened, one new spirit. And so, as we look at Romans 6, 15 through 23, of course, we see that sin is never a good idea. Sin always hurts us. You're going to see this uh, as, 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 as we read this passage. You're going to see sin's never a good idea. Sin always hurts us and others. Sin always harms our testimony. Sin always hinders spiritual growth. Those things you're going to see come out here this morning as we look at this. You're like, I'm watching the clock. No, don't, don't, don't look at the clock. I promise we'll only be here about another 10 or 15 minutes, okay? Because I keep saying the message, the message. You're like, man, okay. What am I trying to say here? God hates our sin for the very simple fact that he loves us so deeply. God hates our sin for the very simple fact that he loves you and me so deeply. Growing up, I used to think, well, God just hates everybody, you know? I mean, you can get that perspective from the Old Testament if you just pull bits and pieces out of the Old Testament and you're like, man, God's always angry. God's always mad. No, God's not always mad, but he is always mad about you. He loves you so much that when he sees you sin, he's like, oh, I hate that sin because I love him so much or I love her so much and I know how that sin's going to hurt them. I know how that sin's going to destroy them. I know what sin did back at the creation. And so God hates our sin for the very simple fact that he loves us so deeply. He knows how destructive sin is. He knows how deeply it will ruin us. Oh yes, sin promises pleasure for a season, but then the payday comes and the price is always painful. You see, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. When we go back to sin after salvation, it's like we leave the front door open to the thief when we go back to sin after being saved. So the challenge this morning as we look at this passage is don't allow Satan to have a foot back in your, the door of your life. Because if you give the devil an inch, he will definitely take a mile. You're not in control of sin. Do not be deceived into thinking that you can control sin because sin will quickly take control of you and you will be its servant. Yes, you might have had your chains broken by grace and yet you can still be trying to go back and hold on to them and all you're going to be doing at that point is carrying around heavy chains in your life, hindering your race. So how does sin affect us? That's really the question I just want to answer for a couple of moments. Three, three ideas of how sin affects us here from Romans chapter 6. Number one, sin only brings shame and guilt from the enemy's accusations. Sin only brings shame and guilt from the enemy's accusations. Look at verse 21. The Bible says, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Paul is talking about here in this passage about how, listen, do you not understand that whoever you serve or whoever you listen to, in fact, up there in verse 16, it says, Know ye not 
that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey. And that word obey there means to listen, to hearken, to give audience to. Whoever you listen to in life, you're going to be their servant. You're going to allow them to have authority over you. Don't buy into this idea that you have absolute autonomy in your life because you don't. No man can serve two masters, but you will serve one or the other. And so what God says here is that sin only brings shame and guilt from the enemy's accusations. Listen, when we have been forgiven of all of our sin through the finished work of Jesus Christ, and when we've been saved, and then we go back and we choose to sin again, all we're doing in that moment when we sin is we're giving voice to the accuser to hurl his accusations of guilt and shame before the throne of God. Satan is the one who burdens us down with guilt and shame when we sin after we've been saved. Well, how can a Christian do that when they've been saved? Ever heard that voice before? Let's very clearly make sure we identify whose voice that is. That is not the Holy Spirit. That is Satan. If you study uh, John 16, we don't have time to do this today, but study verses 7 through 11... And you'll find out what the Holy Spirit's ministry is for both the unsaved and for the saved. In fact, the word convict in the New Testament shows up here in John chapter 16. I believe that's the only time. And it shows up here saying that the Holy Spirit's ministry for believers in Christ is to convince them, to convict them of righteousness. Hmm. Oh, you can grieve the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 4. But isn't that interesting? So when we sin, the only thing we're doing in that moment is we are giving voice to an accuser who was silenced by the cry from the cross of it is finished. You see, Jesus took away the lion's roar. He took away the accuser's, uh, um, the accuser's ammunition. When Jesus says it is finished, the lion tried to roar and it's like... He was silenced. But when we choose to go back into sin, you know all that we're doing in that moment is we're just giving voice to the accuser in our lives. Guilt, shame, doubt. Number two, the second effect of sin in our lives that we see here in Romans chapter 6 is this. Sin only brings bondage back into a person's life. Not only do you find that uh, we, we, we have guilt and shame that comes again from the voice of the accuser, but we also see that sin really only returns us to bondage. The Bible says over in the book of Proverbs, the wicked shall be holden with the cords of his sins. The picture there is of someone who gets all tangled up into sin. The problem is we think we can handle sin. We think that we can control sin. But look at verses 16 and 18. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. What is the Lord telling us here in these two verses? He, he's saying this. You think that you can go and sin... And you're in control of it. No, no. Sin's in control of you. Sin always takes more than you thought it would. Sin always slows us down. I have uh, I brought a visual this morning just so that you can see. Um, and maybe this will help. But um, I have ran several marathons, as you know now. And this is what I run in. Don't worry, I also run in clothing. Shirt and shorts. That's it. That's what I run in. That's all that I run in. These are some of the lightest shoes that you can purchase. Why? Why do I not run in combat boots? Why? Because it's extra weight. Why do I not run with an extension cord around my neck? It's extra weight. Why do I choose to, I mean, if I'm running 26.2 miles, man, that's a bright colored shirt, isn't it? Whew. So that people won't hit me. <laughs> By the way, can I just stop and just say this? I love dogs, but if you're going to have your dog out in the neighborhood and a runner's coming by, please have your dog on a leash. 
I don't know what scripture I can find to back that up, but I've almost been bitten twice now while I'm running. Running can be hazardous to your health, I guess, in several ways. But I love dogs. My kids have asked me several times, Dad, can we get a dog? And I'm like, I just don't know if Mommy's ready for that experiment yet. But a lot of y'all have sweet little dogs, but don't let your doggies bite me if I'm running. But uh, anyway, um, those Dashuns, they're vicious. Sandy's got some Dashun, Dashuns, dot, dot, oh, Dotsons. See, I don't even know what species of dogs, I just know that they're, I just know that they drool, they smell. But anyway, back, back to the point, back, back to the point, is that I, I, when I'm running, it's serious. Listen, why is the Christian life not serious? I mean, I expend, you know, these shoes weren't cheap. Why did I do that? Because I want to make sure that if I'm going to run, that I do it right. Listen, God set us free to run. He set us free to break free of these chains. And he says, for the first time in your life, you can now stretch those legs and you can follow hard after me. You can run the race that you were meant to run, but don't go back into bondage. Don't be set by those weights that so easily beset you. You see, the problem with sin is it only leads to more sin. Look at verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity... What is God saying there? He's saying, look at how sin grows. It leads from uncleanness, which is one word, to iniquity. And the word iniquity in the Bible is the strongest word for sin. So he says it starts with uncleanness, but it goes then to iniquity, unto iniquity. What, what's the picture there? Sin snowballs. It doesn't just stop with one look or one thought. You might say, but it did before. Yeah, but then why do you go back to it again? See, we think that it's kind of time sensitive. You know, well, okay, yeah, I thought about it once last week, but we don't realize that maybe we thought about it twice this week or three times. What sin does is, is it only leads to more sin. That's the argument that God is making here. He's like, listen, you've got a new nature. That's the first reason why we should live holy. Why, obviously, the grace of God isn't an excuse to just live a licentious lifestyle. But the second reason is, listen, sin will weigh, weigh you down. Sin will hinder you. It will only bring shame and guilt from the enemy's accusations. And it will only bring you back into bondage in your life. You and I, we cannot compartmentalize our sin. Don't believe that devil's lie for a second. Sin, you do not own sin. Sin owns you. I do not own sin. Sin owns me if I give voice to it, if I give in to it. Sin will master me. God says something over in Genesis 4, 4 verse 7, very fascinating. He says to Cain, as Cain was being... Tempted with his anger towards his brother Abel before the murder, God says that sin was crouching at the door, ready to have him, to take mastery over him. When we sin, we are allowing that authority back into our life and it brings us back in to bondage. So what's the hope then? If you're here this morning and you, and you find yourself and you feel like you're in bondage to a uh, besetting, habitual sin, what's the hope? Renew your mind to the fact that you have been absolutely 100% forgiven of all sins. Colossians 2.14 says you have been forgiven of all trespasses. Your sins have been forgiven once for all through the once for all shed blood of Jesus Christ and his finished work. And when you start to believe that, then you see God's victory right there in front of you that's always been there because of what Christ has done. And so sin only brings shame and guilt. Sin only brings bondage back into one's life. And finally this morning, sin only invites death and pain back into the life of a believer. Look at verses 21 and 23. It says, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. When I read that verse, I thought of James chapter 1, 
I think, verses uh, 14 through 16, where it talks about the process of sin and how no man um, is tempted of God, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And I think in that enticement is the idea that we can control it. And, you know, there's pleasure in sin for a season. And so then when uh, lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth what? Death. Death. Sin only invites death and pain back into the life of a believer. Look at verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. So sin hinders our spiritual growth. It suffocates a believer from the spiritual oxygen that they so desperately need in their new life in Christ. Sin never ends with success. Sin never ends with life. It always ends with death and defeat. The good news of the gospel this morning is we have been made free. Do you notice how many times that God says that in this passage that we read this morning? Look back with me as we review. Look up at verse 18. It says, being then made free from sin. Verse 22, being now made free from sin. Verse 17, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but if you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. What doctrine was delivered to them? The finished work of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God's grace. They believed it. They received it. Look back at verse uh, uh, 17 of Romans 5. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Christ Jesus. Is it, is it actually possible to be saved and reigning in life and living in victory? Yes. It starts with renewing your mind. The greatest battleground for the believer in Jesus today is the mind. Over and over throughout the New Testament, God says, set your mind on the truth of the gospel. You see, the truth of the gospel says this as we read Romans 6. It tells us that we are no longer slaves to a religion, but we are sons in a relationship. There's a story that comes from the Civil War days, a time where before slaves had been set free by President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation there in 1863. So this happened shortly before the Emancipation Proclamation was given. The story is told about a northerner who went to a slave market to a slave auction and purchased a young slave girl. As they were walking away after the auction had concluded, after the payment had been made, as they were walking away from that auction, the man turned to the little girl and told her, you are free. Obviously, this was rare. It was unheard of. And so this girl just stood there for several moments in amazement, looking up at the man and and said, you mean I'm free? He says, yes, you are free. You mean I'm free to do whatever I want? Yes, you're free to do whatever you want. You mean I'm free to say whatever I want to say? Yes, you're free to say whatever you want. You mean I'm free to be whoever I want to be? Yes. You mean I'm free to go wherever I want to go? He's like, yes, yes, yes. She looked up at him intently and said, then I'll go with you. Why did she say that? When someone purchases our freedom and we understand that we contributed nothing to that and we look at that individual who purchased our freedom, the response will be a loving commitment to that individual. You see, some fear that a grace-delivered, blood-bought radical freedom will result in loveless license. 
But this story and the gospel that we continue to declare gives a resounding God forbid to that silly question, to that silly objection. You see, a redeeming, unconditional love carries the power to compel heartfelt loyalty to the one who bought us back from the slave market of sin. And yes, set us free to say whatever we want to say, to do whatever we want to do, to go wherever we want to go. And when we believe that, we're like, I want to go with you, Jesus. That's the difference. And until the churches of America get clear on that, we'll continue to frustrate ourselves with behavior sin management. But when you receive the light of God's glory and grace, it alone has the power to start to kill the flesh. Romans 6.18 says, Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Duty doesn't result in that. Guilt does not have the power to compel that kind of obedience. Shame doesn't result in that. Fear doesn't result in that kind of obedience. Only understanding the redeeming, unconditional grace of Christ has the power within us to produce this loyalty and commitment to pursue after holiness. The problem with so many Christian lives is that they're lived in fear, they're lived in guilt, they're lived in shame, they're lived in duty, rather than loving loyalty to Christ. Only the grace of God and all of its power and purity can transform and motivate our lives to truly change. So, if you're relying on guilt, shame, fear, or duty in your life as a Christian, you will fail at some point. The only thing that works is an understanding of the redeeming, unconditional love of God. You have been set free. You see, when we understand that Christ has truly done it all, we will adore Him. When we truly believe that it's completely done, that's when we see Him doing things in our life that we can't even begin to explain because you know what? He's the one that began the work, and he's the one that continues the work until the day of Jesus Christ. Father,